let's now get to the heart of the issue. Why am I calling this the power of Prolog and not, for example, the joy or the beauty of Prolog? So what is it that sets Prolog truly apart from other languages? And what makes power its most striking property? And at least as I see it, the thing that is truly unique to Prolog and what gives it its power is the ability to write short and simple meta-interpreters in Prolog. So first of all, what is a meta-interpreter? Well, for a start, an interpreter is a program that evaluates programs from Latin interpretor, interpretari, to explain, expound, understand. And importantly, when I say interpreter, I'm not referring to a particular implementation method, but rather to the essence, which is to express something, in this case a program, in terms of something else. In this case, a program that evaluates the program. So specifically, when I say interpreter, I don't mean that the program is necessarily slow or that it uses any specific implementation method. And in fact, I don't make any assumption about how an interpreter is implemented internally. For example, an interpreter in this sense may also compile the program, for instance, to abstract machine code and so on. We only care that the results we are interested in are observable in some form. For example, let's write an interpreter for C expresses an initial configuration in Conway's game of life, which is true and complete and can therefore express all computations that C and other programming languages can perform. Of course, clearly, many features we expect from a computer are not available in Conway's game of life, but we can represent them all somehow. For example, we can represent the fact that the C program has emitted terminal output as a specific pattern configuration in Conway's game of life. So we can construct a world where input-output devices exist, represented in some way that corresponds to what a C program would do on a computer. And everything a C program can do, such as any system call, memory access, and so on, can be interpreted in terms of Conway's game of life. So the point here is that we can emulate everything a C program could do including, of course, also writing an interpreter for C in Conway's Game of Life. And a meta-interpreter is an interpreter that interprets a language which is similar or identical to its own implementation language. So, for example, a meta-interpreter for Conway's Game of Life would use Conway's Game of Life to express how Conway's Game of Life works. And it would be able to pass a board configuration in a suitable representation of cells and then emulate the exact steps that Conway's Game of Life would perform if we were to run it with that configuration. And an important insight is that different programming languages are differently suited for writing meta-interpreters. For example, Prolog is exceptionally well suited for writing meta-interpreters. That's because first, Prolog is a homo-iconic language from Greek homos, meaning same, and icon, image. This means that Prolog programs are represented as Prolog terms. So a built-in data structure is used to represent programs. For instance, take a rule with two goals. A rule is represented by a term with principal functor colon dash and two arguments, the head and the body. And in this case, the body is a conjunction that is a term with principal functor comma and two arguments, which are individual goals. Now, that alone is not so unusual because several other languages are also homo-iconic, such as Lisp, machine code, and so on. However, Prolog has a second important feature, namely its implicit mechanisms can be used in interpreters. And that's of course even less unusual because it holds for all programming languages. For example, a tickle meta interpreter can of course benefit from tickle's garbage collection which is implicit in Tickle. And a PostScript meta-interpreter can benefit from PostScript's implicit value and dictionary stacks. And a C meta-interpreter can also benefit from implicit features such as the implicit call stack, and so on. And third, Prolog is a very simple language. In fact, if you think about it, then Prolog has only a single language construct, namely head holds if body holds. And this is already quite unique to Prolog. So most, if not all programming languages, 
are conceptually much more complex than Prolog. And I claim the specific alignment of the above points is unique to Prolog. So only in Prolog are these features aligned in such a fortunate way that we can write exceptionally short meta interpreters. So let's start with terminology. First, the program that is being interpreted is called the object program. And the level of the object program is accordingly called the object level. And the level of the meta interpreter is called the meta level. And a meta interpreter is called meta circular if it can interpret its own source code. Absorption means that a meta interpreter uses an implicit language feature and reification means that a meta interpreter makes a language feature explicit. That is, it implements the language feature on the meta level. This is from Latin res rei, thing meta affair, to turn it into a thing. A meta call occurs when a goal is dynamically invoked. This is a, a built-in feature of Prolog and it's available out of the box. For example, if you post goal equals true and goal, then statically, that is considering the query as a Prolog term, goal is a variable. And certainly if you post goal alone, or even if you post goal and then the goal from above, goal equals true, then we get an instantiation error because a variable is insufficiently instantiated to work as a goal. But in this example, this goal here, in fact, unifies goal with the atom true. And so at the time goal is invoked, it's already instantiated. And therefore the query succeeds, yielding the substitution goal equals true. And for example, if we state that goal is equal to the unification x equals a, then in response, we also get the substitution x equals a. And we can make the meta call explicit, writing call of goal, which is equivalent to simply stating goal. And we can use the call n family of predicates to call partial goals with additional arguments appended, which is the basis for map list and other meta predicates. And we can consider this to be the coarsest form of meta interpretation. Because if we perform a meta call, then everything is delegated to the prolog engine. That is, all features are absorbed. Because it's just as if the goal were stated here, like any other goal. Then reflection and introspection. These are language features by which a program can examine itself. And reflection and introspection are closely related. Reflection is often used to mean a specific form of introspection. For example, about specific features such as types, implemented methods and so on. Whereas introspection is often used to denote deeper forms of examination. For example, in cases where a program can inspect its entire source code. And Prolog excels in this regard because Prolog provides many features for reflection and introspection. Most notably, it provides the standard predicate clause, which holds for head and body if and only if there is a clause of this shape. For example, if you have a rule and a fact for a predicate H with two arguments, and we then ask, what are the clauses for this predicate H? Then we get a permission error because H is private, because by default, a predicate definition is private. So we can add a dynamic directive to declare the predicate dynamic. And this also makes the definition public because dynamic predicates are public. So let's try again. Which clauses exist for this predicate? Well, to answer this, the predicate clause considers the given head and then yields all clauses whose heads unify with this first argument in the textual order in which they're stated. So for instance, in this case, the very first clause already matches, or strictly speaking, the head unifies with the head in the query. But we often also say it matches, maybe because it sounds a bit less imperative. And accordingly, the first answer we get is the body of the first clause above, represented, of course, as a prolog term, also as above. And we see that the unification has really taken place because these variables a and b here are the same as in the given head. So we don't get x and y as above in the definition, but we get a and b because that's what we used in the query. So we see that unification happened implicitly, as usual in prolog when invoking a predicate. So we can think of clause as an ordinary predicate that can be used to query the defined clauses. Now, is there another solution? Yes, of course, because this second clause head also matches or rather is unifiable with the head in the query. 
So we also get this second answer corresponding to the fact above. And we see that for facts, the body is the atom true. And that's of course justified because this fact here could be written equivalently as it's true if the built-in predicate true holds, which it always does. So for facts, the body is the atom true. And we again see that unification happened implicitly because this answer, which is in fact a concrete solution, tells us that the argument of the fact are the atoms u and v. And the variables used in the query are now unified with these arguments. So clause lets us inspect the entire predicate definition. That is all clauses, facts and rules. And now let's finally implement a meta-interpreter. And we start with vanilla meta-interpreters. Vanilla in the sense of ordinary or standard without extra features. So let's think about it. When is a goal G true? And let's describe it in Prolog because Prolog code is an executable specification. And if we manage to describe when a goal is true, then we can use the description also to run a Prolog program. So let's do it. Let's introduce a predicate, say MI for a meta interpreter. And we describe the conditions that make MI hold for a goal G. So we want MI of goal to be true if and only if goal holds. Well, that's simple enough, right? Simply say MI of G holds if G holds. Ha! And that's undisputably correct, right? But this is what we mentioned earlier. This is simply a meta call delegating everything to the Prolog engine. So we can't really count this as an interpreter, except maybe in its causal sense, because there's nothing explicit here that we can observe. So in a sense, this interpreter doesn't understand the goal. So let's aim a bit higher and think about the different cases. Well, for one thing, G is certainly true or supposed to be true if it's the atom true, right? Because this built-in predicate is always true. So if G is the atom true, then MI of G should be true. Surely this much is certain. And of course, we can write this more compactly by pulling the unification into the closet. So MI of true holds. Now, what about other cases? Well, certainly the goal can be a conjunction, A and B. And this is true if A is true and B is true. And the main case that remains is that the goal G actually refers to a user-defined predicate. And in that case, G is true if there is a clause with head G and the body of the clause is true, right? And we determine whether the body is true with our meta interpreter. So let's try it. For example, does the goal true hold? Yes, as intended. But on backtracking, we get an error. Why? Because for this goal, the atom true, the first clause applies as intended, and the last one also applies. And that's not intended because the built-in predicate clause doesn't let us inspect the definition of the built-in predicate true. So this definition is not yet correct. And in fact, we don't only have a problem for true, but for conjunction too. Because the last clause also applies for conjunctions and then clause again yields an error. And it's clear how we can solve this because we can simply guard the last clause against these cases. So that clause is no longer invoked for these built-in predicates, which yield an error. So we can simply say for this clause to apply, G must not unify with the atom true. And it also must not be a conjunction. And that would solve it. But it also comes with drawbacks. First, not unifiable with is an impure predicate because it can yield unsound results. And second, we also get redundant choice points with this definition. For example, if you ask, does true and true hold? It tells us, yes, it holds and also leaves a redundant choice point. Because in this case, we rather expect deterministic success. But still, we can already use this meta interpreter. For example, let's define a simple predicate, say netnum, defining what a natural number in successor notation is. So zero is a natural number. And the successor of x, let's denote it by the term s of x, is a natural number if x is a natural number. And we declare the predicate dynamic so that the meta interpreter can inspect this definition using clause. And from now on, we simply always assume that the relevant predicates are declared dynamic or public so that the definition can be inspected. So I'll not mention this every time now. So let's ask, does mi of netnum x hold? And Prolog tells us 
yes, it holds for x equals zero and also for x equals s of zero, that is the successor of zero, so one, also for two and so on. So it works. Because we see here that the meta interpreter interprets the program in exactly the same way as Pollock itself would do it. So we are now getting the exact same results with get if we posted net num of x alone. That is, if we removed the layer of meta interpretation. So that's our first meta interpreter, also known as the vanilla meta interpreter, because that's one of the most straightforward meta interpreters we can write in Pollock. And this meta interpreter absorbs unification and backtracking through clause. Because on backtracking, clause yields all suitable clause borders. And it also implicitly unifies the given goal G with the clause head. And the meta interpreter reifies conjunction. Because here we state what a conjunction means, using our meta interpreter for both goals of the conjunction. And reification is the starting point for more detailed observation and also for changes of these features. For instance, here, having reified conjunction, we can change the way in which conjunctions are interpreted. For example, in this case, we've implemented the default execution strategy of Prolog, where goals in the body of a clause are interpreted in the order in which they are stated. So we first interpret the goal A and then B. But we could also do it differently and interpret B first and then A. So reification gives us freedom to change these features and interpret them differently. And of course, ideally at least, the effort it takes to reify something should be roughly proportional to the level of detail we are interested in. And Prolog is very good with that too. So we see here that it only takes very little effort to reify conjunction. And it only takes slightly more effort to reify the binding environment and so on. And another thing we note about this meta interpreter is that it's not meta circular. That is, it can't interpret its own definition. For example, if you add an additional layer of meta interpretation, so we're asking the meta interpreter to interpret its own code as it interprets the goal net num of x, then we get a permission error. Because this meta interpreter doesn't know anything specific about the not unifiable predicate, which we've used in the definition. And so it tries to access the definition of this built-in using clause, and that doesn't work. So, of course, a meta-circular meta-interpreter must be able to handle all constructs it uses. In a sense, it must understand these constructs, and it must be able to say, aha, construct so-and-so means such and such. For instance, in the present case, we must, in a sense, teach the interpreter that the goal A not equals B is true if a not equals B succeeds. And we can, of course, generalize this to all built-in predicates, for example, by using the reflection predicate, predicate property, to see whether this is a built-in predicate, and if so, invoke it directly instead of trying to obtain its body with clause. But instead of getting carried away with such rather ad hoc consideration, let's take a step back and ask, why is not equals or something similar needed here at all? And the actual reason why we need something like this is because Bolog uses a default representation for clause bodies. What does this mean? Well, what is a clause body? Certainly, the atom true is a valid clause body, and it's used implicitly as the body of facts. Then a comma b is a clause body, denoting a conjunction if a is a clause body and b is a clause body. And also, a goal is a clause body if it's a valid goal. And this must be handled by a default case, in the sense that this clause head always applies, no matter the argument, because the argument goal is a variable and it unifies with every specific goal. And we have to write it like this because goals don't have a common functor. So we can't say by this specific shape, we can tell that the argument is an atomic goal, because it may have almost any functor name except for a few built-in predicates such as conjunction and also any number of arguments. And that's a fault of the representation because we can't use symbolic matching to recognize goals. So we need a default case which always applies and the representation is faulty and we therefore call it a defaulty representation. And with defaulty representation, we can't distinguish all cases symbolically, but need to rely, for example, on guards to prevent certain cases as above. Now, the key insight is 
we can choose a better representation. And a better representation of closed bodies lets us do this. For example, let's adopt a convention that we distinguish individual goals by using the functor plus. So we wrap each individual goal in a compound term with functor name plus and area one with the goal as the single argument of this term, okay? So that's a term with functor name plus and one argument, the goal. And if we do that, that is, if we use the arbitrary functor plus to mark individual goals, then we obtain a so-called clean representation because now all cases are symbolically distinguished by a dedicated functor. Because we have the atom true, then we have conjunctions and we have individual goals. And they all have the same shape, a compound term with functor name plus and one argument, the goal. And clean representations have many advantages and they're good for generality and also for efficiency of polar code. So we are free to choose any representation we want for polar code. And importantly for the topic at hand, a clean representation admits a more elegant meta interpreter because if goals are symbolically distinguished, then we can keep the first two clauses the same as above. And for the last clause, we rely on the fact that all individual goals share the same principal functor plus. And the goal G is true if there is a clause whose head unifies with G and its body is true, according to the meta interpreter. So importantly, we don't need any guards now because the representation already cleanly distinguishes the cases. And for example, if we can take our simple definition of natural numbers, then we must of course adhere to our new convention of using plus to indicate individual goals. And as a consequence, if you now use plain Pollock for queries, then it does find a solution from the fact. And on backtracking, it yields an error because there is no predicate plus with one argument. So this plus we've used to indicate the individual goal now prevents us from using plain Pollock to get more solutions. Well, that's easy to fix because we can of course simply add this definition and say plus of G holds if G holds. And then we could use this definition as is only incurring a slight slowdown for meta calls, which can be compiled away. So by adding this predicate plus, we obtain a working Pollock program. And importantly, we can also use our meta interpreter to run the goal yielding false. Why? Well, because we forgot to add plus here, our marker for an individual goal. And now we get our expected solutions again, zero, one, two, and so on are natural numbers as determined by our meta interpreter, which interprets the program. So this is in a sense, no longer actual Pollock, I mean, the syntax one would normally use for this program due to this plus we introduced, but is also not far removed. And it only takes one additional predicate to make it perfectly valid prolog. And it's certainly very good for meta interpretation because now we no longer need the guards. So this simple convention we've adopted to the node goals has made our life easier. And that's an important insight. A good representation of polar code can greatly simplify meta interpreters. So we're of course free to choose a good representation and we can of course also automatically convert the usual default representation to a clean representation. For example, by relating true to true, a conjunction to a conjunction of clean goals and an individual goal G to plus of G if G is not true and not a conjunction. And we can use this relation to perform the conversion statically, that is on given known polo code, and also dynamically at runtime using the built-in predicate clause for introspection. Now, this experience of course raises a question, namely, is there an even better representation of clauses in the sense that it makes meta interpretation even easier? And interestingly, we can do that. First, let's represent the clause as a polo fact even if it's a rule. So let's use a fact head body of head and goals, where goals is a list of goals in the body. And the list denotes a conjunction of goals. So we now have head is true if each of the goals in the list is true, okay? And we're of course free to represent polar code like this as facts instead of using colon dash. For example, for a definition of net num, we simply write the empty conjunction, which is true by definition for net num of zero. So this always holds. And S of X is a natural number if X is a natural number using a list with a single goal. And of course, we can again easily obtain this representation automatically. 
the normal defaulted representation of closed bodies is also called an end list because it denotes a conjunction. And we can easily relate this to a list using a TCG. So true corresponds to the empty list and a conjunction corresponds to a list comprising the goals of the first contract, A, and then the goals of the second contract, B. And a standalone goal denoted by plus of G in our representation corresponds to a list with a single element, the goal G. And we use phrase to invoke the TCG. For example, phrase of end list of A, B, and C and LS holds if LS is a list with three elements, A, B, and C. And interestingly, this representation of clauses admits an even shorter meta interpreter when we reason about lists of goals. Because in this representation, the empty list denoting the empty conjunction is true. And a list of goals with at least one goal G and tail Gs is true if there is a clause defined by a fact using our convention such that the clause head unifies with this goal G and each goal in the clause body, which is a list of goals, is true. And in addition, the remaining goals Gs in the tail of the list are also true. And we see that the clause is tail recursive because the last goal in this clause is recursive. That is, it calls the predicate that is being defined here. However, we also see that this predicate is recursively invoked also in a goal that is not in a tail position. And therefore, if we interpret, for example, a predicate like this using our meta interpreter, then it runs for a bit and then runs out of local stack space because all these stack frames pile up on the local stack. And we can improve this by fusing these two recursive calls into one. And we do this by fetching the goals of the clause body, say goals zero, then appending these goals zero and the remaining goals G is the tail of the argument into a list of combined goals, which must all hold. And with this simple change, this runs without terminating using bounded local stack, at least if head body is deterministic, which it is in this case. That's because in this version, tail call optimization deallocates the stack frames on the local stack before the predicate is recursively invoked. And therefore the stack frames don't pile up on the local stack. Now, can we do even better? Yes, because we can use a list difference to state the remaining goals. So we use head body underscore to relate the head of the clause to a list of goals, goals zero and goals, denoting that the head holds if the least difference between goals zero and goals hold. So goals zero minus goals, by which we denote the symbolic difference between these lists. For example, our net num predicate becomes one fact for zero, where the goals in the body are the difference between RS and RS, which is the empty list, because this always holds. Zero is always a natural number. And second, the successor of X, S of X, is a natural number if x is a natural number and the tail rs can be used to quickly append further goals here. Because that's the point of list differences. We can append elements in constant time. And this representation allows an exceptionally simple meta interpreter. Because the empty list of goals is true, denoting the empty conjunction. And a list of goals with at least one goal g and tail g's is true if there is a clause whose head unifies with g and the body is goals, and due to this list difference representation, the remaining goals, Gs, can simply be appended now to the goals of the rule. So we are combining lookup and appending here. Whereas in the previous meta interpreter, we used append. So this is also more efficient. And goals hold. So this is a really short and simple meta interpreter, and it fits on two lines of code. So this is one major takeaway here. We can write a prolog meta interpreter with just two clauses and two lines of code. And it works like the previous one, yielding 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on for our sample program. And there's one other interesting thing to this meta interpreter in addition to its simplicity, because the clauses of this meta interpreter can also easily be represented in this way. So for example, the first clause, the fact, stating that the empty list is true in the head can be represented like this, using a list difference to denote that this always holds. And the second clause, the rule, which is about a list of goals with at least one element, holds if 
the list of goals in the body holds. So we simply write the two goals we see above, denoting this conjunction, and then also introduce a tail RS for a least difference version. And the meaning of head body underscore can be described with a rule. So let's use this representation that is using head body underscore to describe the meaning of head body underscore itself. So this predicate relates a head to a list of goals represented as a list difference. And we also use a list difference in this definition. And this relation holds, of course, if there is such a fact relating the head to the list of goals. So in a sense, this is now our own custom implementation of the built-in clause predicate, because we simply use our head body underscore predicate to inspect the definitions of programs. And now this interpreter is meta circular because it can interpret its own code. So for example, if we take again our definition of netnum, then we can use our interpreter to run the program as before, and we can also interpret the interpreter running the program. And that of course gives the exact same results as before. And of course this works arbitrarily deeply layered. For example, we now interpret the interpreter to interpret the interpreter interpreting our sample program netnum. And of course, this again yields the same answers. So this is really unique to Prolog. No other programming language allows such a concise meta-circular meta-interpreter. Okay, now so far we've interpreted Prolog programs in the same way as normal Prolog would do it. And a key advantage of meta interpreters is that they let us interpret things also differently. For example, let's run a polo query in the same way Polo would do it. And in addition, let's construct a proof tree that shows the derivation steps that were performed. So we start with our vanilla meta interpreter with a clean representation, and we equip these clauses with an additional argument for the proof tree. So the proof tree for true could be represented as simply true, because this always holds. And the proof tree for a conjunction consists of the combined proof trees of each element of the conjunction. So if PA and PB are the proof trees showing how A and B can be derived, then the proof tree of the conjunction is simply the concatenation of these proof trees using an end list. And finally, if the body of a clause can be proven with proof P, then if we introduce an, an operator right error for easy readability, then we can denote the proof of goal G as P implies G, right? And when you now ask, is there a natural number X with proof P, then we get as intended solutions together with proofs. And that's of course nice because a proof tree is good for explainability and verification. For example, in this case, we can say because zero is a natural number, its successor, namely one, is also a natural number, and therefore that's a solution. So even though plain prolog does not yield a proof tree, the meta interpreter does yield one. So that's an example of how easily we can extend prolog with features we are interested in. Or as another example, let's perform unification with occurs check. Because for efficiency reasons, the occurs check is often omitted. So in cases like this, where an occurs check is needed for sound results, we get a cyclic term, for example, in Scryer prolog. So we again start with our vanilla meta interpreter and as mentioned, unification takes place implicitly here because clause implicitly unifies the goal G with clause heads in the database. So to gain control over how the unification is performed, we need to make it explicit. For example, let's first change this to make this independent from G. And then we need to manually, so to say, unify G0 and G in such a way that the occurs check is used in the unification. Now, luckily in this case, we don't need to do much because there's actually a standard polo predicate called unify with occurs check, which performs syntactic unification of its arguments with the occurs check enabled. And of course, to use our meta interpreter, we again declare this egg predicate dynamic to make its definition accessible by clause. And now we can already try it. What does our meta interpreter say about this goal? it yields an error. That's because we've specified too little in our call of clause. So let's give clause more information to work with because the first argument cannot be a variable. So let's first use the reflection predicate functor to obtain the functor name f and the rta a of our goal and then use the same predicate to construct g0 
where all arguments are free variables. And then our meta interpreter fails, as expected, because x, of course, does not unify with f of x, with your curse check enabled. Of course, in Scryer prolog, we don't need a meta interpreter for this, because we can simply set the prolog flag occurs check to true to enable the occurs check for all unifications. But in prolog systems where this flag is not available, we can use such a meta interpreter to simulate it. And we can also take this a lot further, because we have considerable freedom over what we consider unifiable. So in the previous example, we performed unification with occurs check. And we can go far beyond this in terms of flexibility, because we are in no way limited to concrete terms that arise in programs. We may just as well say, let's not reason about these concrete terms, but about abstract domains, where we consider entire sets of terms identically. For instance, let's take the Ackermann function, which after the Sudan function was the second function shown to be recursive, but not primitive recursive. And using successor notation, we can write it like this. And for easier reasoning about the function, we can of course also use a more suitable clean representation, like this, where we're using lists of goals. And all unifications that involve compound terms are explicit using equals. And now we can interpret this differently than normal prolog would. For example, we can say, let's forget about concrete numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on, and instead reason about the abstract domain consisting of 0 and 1 as specific numbers, and even and odd for all other natural numbers. And to do this, we only need to describe what each of these predicates means over this domain. So we write a small meta interpreter, say ACK proof, and use it to define how, for example, equals is to be interpreted over this domain. And in this case, we no longer interpret equals in the usual sense, where it denotes syntactic equality, but in a different way where we define, for example, that the atom 0 is to be considered unifiable with the integer 0. And the atom 1 is unifiable with the successor of 0, s of 0. And the number 2 is even. And an even number plus 2 is also even. And so on. And likewise for net num of x, which in our abstract interpretation means that x is one of the abstract domain elements, 0, 1, even or odd. And the only remaining predicate is ACK. And we interpret this to hold if a fitting fact was derived already. So we keep track of a list of facts we already know about this predicate and we use an argument to carry this list around. And for equals and net num, we simply ignore this argument. And we can now use this definition to derive all logical consequences by computing a fixed point. So we say, suppose we have already derived the facts ds0, then we perform one more derivation step obtaining ds1, and then if nothing new has been derived, so if ds0 and ds1 are the same, then we found a fixed point of derived consequences ds, and otherwise, and so on. So, I won't go into the details here, but simply refer you to a very nice publication by Kodish and Sondergaard for more information about this idea. And in this paper, they show that in total, we obtain an interesting arithmetic fact about the Ackermann function, namely that the result is odd and greater than one in all cases where the first argument is greater than one. And that's not obvious from the definition of the function. And a concrete interpretation of the program cannot derive this because there are infinitely many cases to consider. But we can derive it by abstract interpretation. Because over this domain, the number of cases is finite. So this shows again that when we've made something explicit, that is, we've reified it, then we have control over it and can also interpret it differently. Now, let's consider one more instance of this by reifying backtracking. That is, we now use prolog to describe Prolog's default search strategy, which is depth-first search with chronological backtracking. For example, say we have a predicate A, which holds if B holds, and also if C and D hold. Now, to implement Prolog's execution strategy, let's think in terms of a stack of alternatives, where each alternative is a list of goals that must hold. For example, suppose we're interested in the conjunction of two goals A and B. then we represent this as a list with two elements, A and B. And initially, this is one alternative in a list of alternatives. And 
Starting from such a list of alternatives, we can think of Pollock's execution strategy as a sequence of inference steps, where each inference step transforms the current list of alternatives. And of course, in general, each alternative can have many goals, not only two. And each inference step looks at the first alternative and within that alternative at the first goal, in this case A, and then considers all clauses where the head unifies with the goal. So colloquially, we call them the matching clauses, even though we are actually thinking about unification. So in this case, the first clause applies and the second clause also applies. And in such cases, Pollock would first try the first clause that applies and then on backtracking, consider the alternatives in the order in which they are stated. Now, our goal here is to reify backtracking. So of course, we cannot use Pollock's built-in backtracking here because that would keep backtracking implicit and therefore for feed control of it. Instead, what we do now is we make all alternatives explicit. So we transform this list of alternatives to a new list where the first alternative corresponds to the first clause. So in the first alternative, we replace the goal A with the body of the first clause. And in the second alternative, we replace A with the body of the second clause, which applies. So we have a new list of alternatives and we transform this list in the same way. Look at the first alternative and within that alternative at the first goal, then find all clauses that apply and so on. So we continuously transform the list of alternatives. And if we encounter the situation that the first alternative is the empty list and possibly further alternatives A's remain, then we succeed because this means that the goal has been successfully derived. And then we continue with the remaining alternatives, if any. And in this way, we consider all alternatives in turn, just as Pollock would in its default execution strategy. So our key predicate for this will relate a list of alternatives where A is the first alternative to a new list A's of alternatives. And it holds if, well, we said that in the first alternative A, we consider the first goal, say G0, and let RS denote the remaining goals in the first alternative. And using our least difference representation, we select a clause whose head unifies with G0, and we call the body Gs. And we can also immediately append the remaining goals RS. So this expresses the core idea. But we don't want to try these alternatives on backtracking because we said that we wanted to make backtracking explicit. So we wrap this in a call of find all so that we deterministically collect all clause bodies that apply. So these are the new alternatives we find in this step, which arise from all clauses that apply for the first goal. And we can use find all with four arguments to efficiently append the original remaining alternatives is zero to this new list A's. And due to the way find all works, if this unification fails, that is, if no goal remains for an alternative, then this alternative simply vanishes from the list of alternatives. And the next alternative becomes the first alternative in the new list. So this predicate defines one step of the inference process. And we now only need to add the actual interpreter. So as we said, if no goals remain to be proved for an alternative, then we succeed. And further, for the current alternatives AS0, we perform one step of the transformation relating AS0 to a new list of alternatives AS and interpret them too. So this now mimics the inference process of Pollock. However, we'd also like to actually see the derived consequences. So we need to report the variable bindings. And to do this, we pass along the goal G we want to interpret. So we add an argument to this meta interpreter to pass around the goal, also here and here. And further, we also add the goal we are interpreting to each of the alternatives. So each alternative we find shall be a pair of goals and the shape of the goal we are interpreting. And I say shape because find all creates copies of terms. So in the computed alternatives, G is no longer the original goal, but a version of the goal where all variables have been replaced by fresh copies. And also here, 
we need to add G. So each alternative now comes equipped with a copy of the original goal. And the variables and bindings which are used in each alternative apply to that specific branch of the computation. So we now only need to relate the variables of an alternative to the variables used in the query. And we can do this simply by unifying the original goal with the copy of the goal that is carried around with the alternative, okay? And now for convenience, let's add an interface predicate. We say G0 holds if MI underscore holds for a list of alternatives, which initially consist of only one alternative, a list containing only the given goal. And we also equip the alternative with this original goal so that bindings can be reported eventually. So this is the initial list of alternatives. And in the second argument, we pass around the goal and that's it. And we can use this interpreter by specifying a goal and it interprets the goal and yields answers. So backtracking here is only used in the interface predicate to report answer substitutions because the first clause of mi underscore creates the bindings and the top level reports the answer. And the second clause continues to transform the alternatives. And the core logic takes place in this single find all goal because this find all deterministically collects all alternatives. So this meta interpreter shows what is needed to implement prolog in languages that don't have search and backtracking. Because essentially you only need to emulate this find all somehow. And this may not be very efficient and an actual prolog system of course implements backtracking much more efficiently, but it shows the principle of a core mechanism of prolog at least for the default search strategy, without using the mechanism implicitly. So reification is also useful to study and explain how an otherwise implicit mechanism works in addition to the usual advantage we gain from reification, namely that we can modify how it works. For example, in this case, we can of course change the search strategy by reordering the alternatives. And we can, for instance, implement breadth first search by exploring the alternatives differently and so on. Now, you may have a question at this point and the question may be, how important is all this? And personally, I think it's important to know about interpretation because at least as I see it, interpretation is pervasive in computer science, both from a theoretical and also from a practical perspective. For example, in theory, interpretation is used to obtain various completeness results, such as NP completeness, starting with Cook's theorem and including all kinds of reductions to prove that one problem is at least as hard as another problem, essentially by interpreting one problem in terms of another one and showing that solving one of them would also solve the other one. Or for example, Turing completeness of various languages and formalisms. Again, you show that the language is at least as powerful as another one by writing an interpreter for it. And you show Turing completeness of a formalism by using it to simulate a Turing machine with it. And so on. And on the flip side, various incompleteness results are also closely related to interpretation. For instance, Gödel's first incompleteness theorem can be obtained by compiling a proof system to statements about natural numbers. And Many other incompleteness and undecidability results can likewise be obtained by showing that a given formalism can interpret a Turing complete formalism and therefore some of its properties are not decidable. And also quite generally, every time you are interested in determining the power of a formalism, a good question to ask is what can we actually express and interpret with this formalism? For example, can we interpret a finite automaton or a pushdown automaton or a Turing machine and so on? So when you're given any formalism, such as a programming language or a type system or a template system and so on, your first reaction should not be, ma, this language is so ridiculous, this language is so useless and so on, but rather look intently at the formalism and ask yourself, how can I use this to express various things? Because the power of the formalism depends on this. And interpretation is also pervasive in practice to such an extreme extent that it's fair to say 
most programs are, at least among other things, interpreters for specific languages. And we all know many examples for this, such as web browsers, which interpret HTML, JavaScript, various protocols, and so on. Or as another example, many programs interpret command line arguments and behave differently depending on which switches you specify and so on. There's of course also a case of interpretation because the program must analyze the switches and so on. Or take for example an editor which interprets user input or specific languages such as regular expressions or more complex extension languages for scripting and so on. Or any program that reads settings from a configuration file and then interprets these settings. Entire documents are specified every day as programs which are interpreted in PostScript, Tech, and so on. And there are many more cases like this. So the concept of interpretation is so pervasive that we often don't even notice it anymore. Yet it's used, at least to some extent, in almost every program. For example, every letter here is drawn by interpreting a small language which in this case is a set of points defining Bezier curves. So for instance, here's a set of points, two endpoints and two control points for each curve segment, and the curves are drawn by recursively subdividing these segments and computing certain points that belong to the curve. And in a few iterations, we get quite smooth curves, which in a final step, we only need to fill. So this is how every letter here is drawn computed dynamically by applying certain instructions to the input. And in fact, this entire presentation is the result of interpreting a program with GNU Emix. So many programs are interpreters also in practice. And the languages they interpret need not always be true and complete. And the languages need not even be visible to the outside because also within programs, Many tasks are often best expressed in dedicated languages that need to be interpreted. For instance, take library CLPZ in Scryapolog, which implements a constraint solver over integers. Then an important part of this library is, of course, parsing an integer expression. And for this, the library uses a dedicated mini language to describe which expressions it can handle and also what must take place when a specific expression is encountered. For example, this small language describes that the arguments of the expression are also passed, or that propagators are attached and activated and so on. And this is of course useful because this dedicated language makes the code easier to read and analyze than plain Pollock, and also helps to avoid certain classes of mistakes. And there are several other such mini languages in the library code, and they are compiled to plain Pollock every time you load the library. So what we see here is an example of code as data. Because in such cases, the instructions that are interpreted are the data. And of course, many programs treat code as data. For example, compilers, interpreters, debuggers, editors, all treat code as data. So that's nothing unusual. However, in many of these examples, programs treat code as separate from themselves. Even though in some of such programs, we can also use code to change the behavior of the program. For example, in debuggers and editors, we may be able to script specific actions, that is, provide code to automate tasks. And such examples are very interesting because a program becomes truly flexible by allowing dynamic changes to its logic. Because, for example, in many highly regulated areas, it's not enough to simply write a program once because new laws and regulations must be constantly adopted. So. You must write your programs in such a way that you can easily incorporate new rules and regulations, ideally dynamically, that is, without recompiling and newly deploying the program itself, but on the fly. This is needed, for example, in banks and insurance companies, and also many government IT services. For instance, take the single digital gateway regulation, SDG for short, which you can easily find online. So. This is an EU regulation of the European Parliament and it's already in effect. And specifically, Article 14 mandates that a technical system be built to implement the once-only principle for cross-border exchange of evidences for certain online procedures such as e-procurement and so on. And this regulation obligates all EU member states to make their evidences available in an electronic format that allows automated exchange between countries 
So evidence is usually important for this article. And evidence could be all kinds of documents, such as passports or information from a certain registry or university certificate and so on. And Annex 2 of the regulation lists procedures for which evidence exchange must work cross-border between member states. And there are quite a few of them. So this regulation is an example of a law with quite far-reaching consequences. And the usual approach of building IT services as quite static entities fails completely here because everything is subject to change. Processes in member states change, IT services change, the format of these documents change and so on. So the solution must be very dynamic. And one way to model this is to use Pollock rules that describe how a certain data field or evidence can be obtained in each country. For instance, in Austria, we may relate a person P to address A if something holds. For example, some specific registry contains the address. And in other countries, the evidence may be obtained differently. And once we have all these rules, a Pollock meta interpreter can dynamically look up a fitting rule and also interpret it. So in this way, we can dynamically adapt the system to new situations. And there are countless other examples like this, such as in banks, as already mentioned, and also in other government services, for instance, to determine which grants apply for a company and so on, where the conditions and also types of companies change all the time and so on. And of course, the rules need not be stored in the Prolog database because we can, of course, also dynamically read the rules from a file or from a web service and so on. And we can use Prolog to assert the rules or also keep the database completely unchanged and still interpret the rules dynamically. For example, we can use the standard predicate read to read a term. For instance, suppose we enter a rule here, then the variable t is bound to this rule, represented as a term. So this is, of course, a term with principal factor colon dash and two arguments, just like a prolog rule in a source file. It's not stated in a program, though, but read dynamically. And note that logic variables on the object level, that is, in the term we wrote, are also logic variables on the meta level. That's a key reason why we can easily absorb so many prolog features in meta interpreters. Now, let's briefly consider how we can interpret a goal with respect to a given list of clauses to show that the clauses can be supplied dynamically and the program can stay the same. So we have true holds with respect to any clauses. So we don't care about the clauses. And the conjunction A and B holds with respect to a list of clauses if both A and B hold with respect to the clauses. And finally, let's state when an individual goal holds with respect to the given list of clauses. And let's use G of goal for a change instead of plus. And for this, we need to mimic the Prolog database. So first, we create a copy of the list of clauses. So we copy the given list clauses zero to a new list clauses, creating fresh variables. Because when applying a rule, we must use new variables each time. And then we need to find a rule in the list clauses whose head unifies with the goal we want to interpret. And the body of the rule must hold with respect to clauses. And that's all. So no database changes are necessary to interpret the object program. So we can, for example, interpret our NetNum example by dynamically specifying the rules. One clause for the fact, but the body is true, and one clause for the recursive rule. And we get our usual solutions, one, two, three, and so on. So we can easily extend and adapt our programs with new code, specified dynamically, and interpreted in the exact way we want it. For example, we can write a meta interpreter that runs a program and at the same time prevents certain things, such as network connections, file access, and so on. So only interprets safe goals. And in fact, in many applications, code is the only relevant data. For instance, consider those escalation trials in clinical oncology, such as 3 plus 3 designs. This is essentially an algorithm specified as a set of rules. For instance, we start by enrolling three patients at the lowest dose level. And then, depending on the number of dose-limiting toxicities, we escalate or de-escalate or repeat it with new patients or stop the trial. And maybe we apply additional rules or variants of this design. And before we even apply this in practice, we can pose certain questions about the trial design itself. For example, does this always stop? Or is there a situation where we accidentally repeat the dose forever or are caught in a loop? 
or are there better strategies to find the target level, maybe with fewer toxicities in the best case or on average? And also other questions such as, is there any case of ambiguity or incompleteness where a situation arises that is not covered by the rules and so on? So this is an example where code is the relevant data. And we can perform this analysis of the rules themselves without even running a single clinical trial, just by interpreting the rules and reasoning about them, using, for example, abstract interpretation or exhaustive enumeration. And if you're interested in this topic, check out recent work by David Norris, available on his webpage. And when talking about data, the question is not, is the data machine readable? Because it usually is. Because also a JPEG file or a video is machine readable. Rather, the key question is most often, is the data machine interpretable? And how can a machine interpret the data? Because machines can only work syntactically, not semantically. The meaning of the data is not accessible and cannot be processed by a machine. So we make data machine interpretable by specifying rules. And a program becomes flexible if it can interpret dynamic rules to deduce logical consequences of the available data. And how easy this is depends on the programming language. Of course, most programming languages are true and complete. So in a sense, they're all equally powerful. What's more interesting is how powerful are they in relation to the syntactic and semantic complexity? For example, machine code has a simple syntax and simple semantics. And that makes meta interpretation easy. It's homoiconic because machine code is expressed in bits and bytes and therefore easy to reason about in machine code. Then we have several languages like C, Pascal, Rust and so on, which have comparatively complex syntax and many language constructs, type annotations and so on. And they lack the uniformity of machine code, which is easy to process. And then we have very high level languages like Prolog, Lisp, Postscript and so on, where the abstract syntax tree is available as a term and there are only a few constructs that are easy to interpret. So interestingly, both very low level and very high level languages strike a nice balance between expressiveness and simplicity. Whereas these languages in the middle are quite complex and also less expressive, especially when it comes to meta interpretation. For example, it's comparatively hard to write a C program that interprets a useful subset of C code. Whereas as we've just seen, it's very easy to write a Prolog program that interprets a useful subset of Prolog. Of course, these languages also have their valid use cases. For instance, C is good for adding security problems in your applications. Pascal is probably also good for something. And Rust is a nice systems programming language. But to build really flexible and dynamically extensible programs, we need programming languages that allow easy processing of code. And that's indeed a good test for the power of a language. Use it to write a meta interpreter. Because this gives you some indication of what the language is worth. If writing a meta interpreter is hard, then maybe reconsider the design. And we can of course use meta interpreters not only to change the behavior of Prolog, but also to add completely new features. And indeed a common strategy to prototype a new Prolog feature is to write a meta interpreter that adds it. For instance, you can write extensions from automatic program slicing or a module system or a type checker or in case your system doesn't provide it already, an extension for attributed variables or a grammar formalism. For example, where we're able to write a grammar rule and then use a predicate like phrase to apply the grammar to a list. And most Polk systems already implement such a mechanism called definite clause grammars, DCGs. But if they didn't, then we could easily add it by writing an interpreter for them and so on. And of course, this isn't as efficient as adding the feature to the engine due to the interpretative overhead. But there are, of course, ways to solve this. For example, we can use partial compilation to compile away the runtime overhead by doing as much as possible already at compile time. And also, if a feature turns out to be useful and needs to be faster, then we can, of course, also add it to the engine at a lower level 
Now, you may still wonder, who really needs all this? I mean, sure, we can extend Polo, we can interpret it differently, we can dynamically add new logic to a program and so on. But still, is this ever needed in actual practice? I mean, in the real world, where Prolog doesn't exist, obviously. And to answer this, let's consider the architecture of a few famously versatile programs. Take Tech, GoScript, a PostScript interpreter, and GNU Emacs. And these programs have an important commonality, because they are all interpreters for languages. Now, that's of course not unique at all, because as mentioned, most, if not all programs, are interpreters for some language, or at least mini-language. For instance, Microsoft Word is also an interpreter, because it interprets docx files, and it draws letters, pages, and so on, depending on the instructions in these binary files. And in fact, Word even includes a second interpreter for a completely different language, namely Visual Basic for Applications, a basic dialect. Now I ask you, what is the essential difference between Tech and Microsoft Word? It's obvious, right? Because Word has a user interface and implements what you see is what you get, right? And Tech doesn't. But I ask you, is this really an essential difference? Because after all, it's easy to write a frontend for Tech too. And obviously, I can also edit Word files with Emacs, for example, just like Tech and PostScript files. And Word doesn't care which applications are used to edit a docx file, just like Tech. It's only that editing Word files with anything other than Word is extremely impractical. Because the file format is proprietary and the specification is not open. So this amounts to writing a program in a language whose syntax we don't know. So we'd first have to reverse engineer the compiler or find out the syntax with trial and error. But still, in principle, we can do it. So Maybe it's not a matter of essence, but of degree. Because words, in a sense, core language, namely these docx files, are extremely hard to use when we want to specify a document. Whereas in these programs, such as Tech, the core languages are very easy and straightforward to use. And in fact, the languages are so powerful that They are not only extension languages, because large parts of these applications themselves are written in the languages they interpret. So, for example, large parts of Tech are written in Tech itself. And most of Emacs is written in Emacs Lisp. And this is a good indicator of the power of an extension language. Is it powerful enough to implement significant parts of your application in it? And even better, Is it powerful enough to allow easy meta-interpretation? And if you think you don't need meta-interpretation, because you've never seen it in practice, then maybe it's because you're working only with languages that make it hard. And that imposes very severe restrictions on what you can do with your programs. So to get more flexible programs, Design your extension languages so that they can also easily interpret their own code. 